Uh, today's topic is uh, essentially we will restrict it to mechanism of labor okay, because uh, in uh, normal labor there is mechanism of labor there is uh, management of labor so there are two things now why is it important to know about mechanism of labor what happens as a matter of fact if you look at the whole uh, this is the third or fourth one that we are going to discuss mechanism uh, then actually it starts with how does the labor start? The physiology, the pharmacology, and uh, the processes which are involved in initiation of labor at a particular time in pregnancy. Why doesn't it start at 30 weeks? Why does it start at generally normal labor is that which starts after 37 completed weeks and results in the birth of a healthy normal baby. In the and normal labor. Uh, so, uh, why does it start after that? Why doesn't it start early? What is the triggering factor? What is stopping it from expelling it? Because, you know, uh, the baby is half or the fetus is half of paternal origin. It's uh, the chromosome, the material is derived from the, the husband or the father. And uh, a half is that, and the natural reaction of the body is to expel something which is foreign to it, and it generally would be expelled. So, what are the immunological processes which are there which keep the uh, pregnancy intact, and what then triggers the, the chain of events which ultimately culminates in the initiation of labor and then the progress of labor and all that. So, uh, try to figure out, try to find out. Uh, this is the question for next time. What are the factors which start trigger the process of labor? Okay, have you thought about it? Sometimes, and then once it starts, then what are the various uh, elements which are involved in the process of labor? Uh, which would uh, cause dilatation of the cervix, then uh, descent of the uh, the baby and the presenting part in the baby, and how it goes through the birth canal, and uh, how it is delivered, and uh, the follow-up. Right. So those are the things which we need to know. Now, the labor starts, the baby passes, uh, through the uh, birth canal and we hold it and uh, catch it and that's it. So what is the fun in doing all this about or knowing about the mechanism of labor? It is because then you can identify if you are following labor, that what is normal and what is abnormal and when does the abnormality begin? So that you, if you are following labor, you are managing it, you are monitoring the labor, then you would either take uh, steps which uh, will overcome that abnormality right. or then uh, you uh, uh, make allowances for that abnormality as you uh, uh, observe the progress of labor. Right. So those are, that, that's why it is important. And uh, other elements which are involved with that are some of the anatomical considerations. Uh, anatomy of the pelvis, right. anatomy of the fetal head, uh, and then clinical support. So you should have a background of anatomy of the female pelvis. What is what are the various dimensions? What are the various parts of the bony pelvis which are involved in that? Right. So these are the questions which you will be. Uh, I I will uh, discuss with you next Wednesday. The female pelvis. And what are the classical, just names of the classical, I wouldn't want you to go into the details of the parameters of various types of pelvis. So what are different types of pelvis described, like android, manifoid, platyphaloid, anthropoid, etc. Uh, and what are the characteristic features of a typical so-called manifoid pelvis? What are various uh, diameters 
that in the cavity uh, outlet, what comprises outlet, what is inlet, what are the boundaries of that. Similarly, uh, what are various diameters of the fetal head and uh, uh, why is it uh, important for the fetus to resume a certain position to go through the pelvis? And what are the factors which uh, contribute towards it assuming uh, those positions? Uh, so those are the things which uh, you need to know. So pelvis, fetal head, uh, the process, how it starts, uh, whether it is the maternal thing or it has uh, some fetal contribution to come into it, etc., etc. So these are the questions that I will be asking you next time. So over to Dr. Sunila Reyaz, who is going to talk about normal labor, but we are going to emphasize in this particular presentation on the mechanism. You can go ahead or whatever. Up. I can go ahead, sir. Uh, skip these things. My name is Dr. Sunila Riaz. I'm a second year resident of FCPS in Gyni and Obstetrics in Hamid Latif Hospital. Today, the topic of discussion is um, normal labor, its definition, its diagnosis, its physiology, and its mechanism. Uh, all those who are uh, with us on the net, now, labor is the process of the childbirth which starts with the onset of regular, painful, and effective uterine contractions, and it ends with the delivery of the baby and expulsion of the placenta. WHO defined normal presentation labor as aari, sir. low risk at the start of labor and remain remaining through so throughout labor and delivery. The diagnosis is usually clinical. Differentiation between true labor and false is the in true labor there are painful uterine contractions that occur at regular intervals and it usually occurs at term. The, the frequency the frequency uh, the frequency intensity and duration increases gradually uh, and increasing up to, uh, that occurs every three to five minutes and duration increases up to uh, 30 to 60 seconds. It is usually associated with show, which is bloody discharge, that is dislodgement of mucus plug from the cervix. There is progressive effacement and dilatation of cervix. There is descent of the presenting part and formation of bag of water. It is usually not relieved by normal analgesic serenoma. Now, when uh, when we labor at chest falls labor, when this, there are dull pain that is confined to the groin and abdomen, the pain interval doesn't shorten and pain intensity, it remains same. There is no effect on cervical dilatation or hardening of the uterus and it is relieved by analgesics. Criteria for normal labor, it must be spontaneous in onset, spontaneous expulsion, usually single fetus, but uh, multiple fetuses may be present. It is a mature fetus presented by the vertex. It is uh, through the birth canal and within a reasonable time, not less than three hours and not more than 18 hours. And it must be without complications to the mother and fetus. Now, there are irregular involuntary spontaneous uh, spasmodic uterine contractions that are known as Braxton Hicks that are present throughout pregnancy. Uh, that are present throughout pregnancy and uh, it changes during labor. What uh, initiation of labor? Uh, there are some factors that initiate labor. These are basically mechanical effect, endocrine, and neuromediator. When there is compression of the fetus on lower segment during end stage of labor, it causes cervical excitation. End stage of pregnancy. Instead of pregnancy, uh, it causes cervical excitation and it induces initiation of labor. The endocrinetic effect is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, there of, is also of mother or fetus of the fetus. Uh, that's important to say. Okay, sir, again, can uh, oh, oh, wow, yes. explanation. Uh, neuromediation uh, sir, effect sir, sir, slight mother in, in initiation of sorry, labor. It is no. yet hmm? uncertain. Share, sir. Screen share. Screen share. Kya? Sir, 
स्क्रीन की तरफ करने से तो नहीं हुआ है आगे जाना है वो तो कंप्यूटर के साथ लगी हुई है जो डिवाइस है जिसपे जाना है वो वैसे उधर से आ गया मतलब बस उसको स्क्रीन तो इनर्ट है उसके तो कुछ नहीं लगा तो स्लाइड शेयरिंग पे इशू आ रही है नहीं स्लाइड चेंज तो हो जाएगी लेकिन अब शेयर हो गया नहीं शेयरिंग पे मसला आ रहा है इस पे मीटिंग की शेयरिंग पे मसला है क्यों वो शेयर तो नीचे आ जाता है इसके ऊपर हां वो आ जाता लेकिन वो ब्लर डिसेबल कर रहा है इस तरह से कहां पे रिसर्च हो गया तो हो गया हो गया और मैं सरकार को ये आगे जा रही हूं तो आगे जा रही हूं इसको बैक करेंगे वहीं से बैक कर रहा हूं इसको नहीं बैक कर रहा हूं इसे हम सेकंड साइड से आप भी हो ये साइड में पीछे 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 और प्लस वन Uh, now, as we all know, during pregnancy, the main hormone progesterone uh, it causes uterine muscle relaxation through three effects. That is, it suppresses the production of prostaglandin. It inhibits the initiation of. Uh, Aapki screen pe. Sir, ye, ji sir, ye kaha kuch aur. It inhibits uh, the uh, interaction. Uh, it inhibits the communication between myometrial cells, and uh, it uh, uh, prevents the uh, release of oxytocin. Uh, 
uh, when uh, at the end stage of labor, there are changes in hypothalamic pituitary adrenal uh, axis, which causes activation of adrenal cortical of, of the fetus. Of the fetus. It causes activation of adrenocorticotrophic hormone from the fetal pituitary that stimulates the adrenals to produce cortisol and dehydroepiandrosterone. De uh, DHEA is converted into estrogen, that is estriol and estradiol, which, is, uh, which increases the estrogen progesterone ratio and uh, increases um, the um, oxytocin receptors on the myometrium. Uh, cortisol causes maturation of lungs and kidneys. The mature lungs and kidneys, they activate the fetal membrane to produce the prostaglandin that increases the oxytocin receptors and on the myometrial cells. uh, now the main hormones that participate in the initiation of labor, these are estrogen, progesterone, uh, prostaglandins, and oxytocin. The estrogen promotes the synthesis of myometrial receptors for the oxytocin, uh, increases the release of oxytocin from material pituitary. Prostaglandin increase uh, in gap junctions in the myometrial cells, and uh, there is increased synthesis of uh, myometrial contractile proteins through CAM. Prostaglandins, it initiates and maintains labor. The major sites of production are amnion, chorion, decidual cells, and myometrium. It also enhances that gap junction formation, which is mostly triggered by the estrogen, glucocorticoid, separation, or rupture of the membrane. Now, the, uh, there are two types of prostaglandins, that is prostaglandin E2, which causes survival rightening, and uterine uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha, that causes uterine contraction. No, this is important actually. If you look at it, this is important from the point of view. If we are to induce labor, what would we give? Would we give prostaglandin or would we give prostaglandin E2? As uh, has been just said, that prostaglandin E2 causes uh, is on the that causes. Uh, Prostaglandin E2 causes ripening and softening of the cervix. Whereas prostaglandin F2 alpha that has greater effect on the uterine myometrium. The structure of myometrium of the body of the uterus in the cervix differs because cervix predominantly is of collagenous tissue, whereas the body of the uterus is predominantly and overwhelmingly that is of uh, involuntary muscles which are the myometrium. And uh, these two types of prostaglandins have their effect on either uh, uh, the myometrium or the surface. So if you give prostaglandin F2 alpha, initially in 60s and 70s when research was going on on these, prostaglandin F2 alpha was used at that time. And like oxytocin, oxytocin also has effect on myometrium and therefore those triggered uterine contractions. And it was thought that it was the uterine contractions which would essentially uh, start and then cause progress of labor. Now, what happens actually, there is a kind of what we call it bipolarity of the uterus, that the uterine musculature from above that contracts, and as it contracts, the, uh, remember the myometrial cells, they, the, the fibers, they have this uh, capacity to contract, mm -hmm. and then also uh, relax. The relaxation, relaxation is important because if the myometrium wouldn't relax, then there will be discontinuation or severe compromise of the blood flow to the central vent, and that would cause fetal hypoxia and ultimately anoxia. And therefore, those contractions and then that period of relaxation in between the contractions is important. Now, 
the biomedical cell fibers, they contract and then relax. But there is also a third activity which goes on, and that is called the retraction. So the, when the muscle contracts, it's it's for a certain length initially. When it contracts, it becomes shorter, and then it relaxes. But when it relaxes, it doesn't go back to its original length, but remains a little shorter. So that makes the muscle fiber a little thicker. And with progress uh, of labor, the muscle fibers, they become shorter in length, and they but become thicker. Now, what happens because of this retraction is that there is when the, uh, the, the, the electrical system of the uterus is such, like in the heart, we have uh, 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 what, what do you call from where the impulses start? Yes, yes. Similarly, those, that kind of node is in the uterus, which would uh, cause its contraction. And the contraction starts from above and spreads like a wave downwards. Now, in that fashion, the upper muscles they contract and they push the baby down. And when they retract, they maintain some of that distance which is gained by that. On the contrary, in the lower part of the uterus, the cervix is pulled upon. It is pulled upon, and that pulling upon is my hands are the cervix, and gradually pulling upon would cause the dilatation of the internal os. Ultimately, it becomes one one particular canal, the cervical canal disappears and it becomes just that. And then there is further dilatation and the cervix becomes continuous with the vaginal canal. So when the uh, upper parts of the uh, uterus, they contract and reject, they pull upon the lower segment and the lower segment not only stretches and opens up, but it also becomes thinner. And that's why you would see that in the uh, and made liver, or when you have to do the cesarean section uh, after a prolonged liver, you find that the lower segment is much thin. In doubt, and even uh, for a primary gravida, in multiples or those who have had previous cesarean sections, we see that the scar is thinned out like a membrane. But even in a primary gravida who has been in labor for a sufficiently long period of time, you will see that the upper part of the uh, edge would be thicker and the lower part is thinner. So this is how the myometrial uh, coordination uh, with the cervix brings about pushing of the baby, opening up of the cervix, and of course the fetal head or the presenting part with most of the cervix head so far. Uh, we do not uh, discuss the abnormal presentations. We will take it to be a normal flex, occipital exterior or occipital conscious head. So that also is a mechanical dilator for the cervix. So that's a mechanical dilator, and then there is pulling up of the uh, cervix by the myometrial fibers. So this is how the baby is uh, gradually pushed, and the way is made for it to come down. Now, the second, uh, the most important hormone is oxytocin. Uh, that uh, um, it, it is a peptide hormone. Uh, when the hypothalamus sends impulses to the posterior pituitary, it is released, uh, and uh, its receptors are mostly present on the fundus, which increase during pregnancy. Its actions are, it induces uterine contractions in two ways, that is, stimulate the release of prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin F2 alpha in the fetal membrane. It also directly induces myometrial contractions through phospholipase C. Now, there is diagrammatic representation of how um, the uterine contractions and what is the positive feedback loop. There is stretching of the cervix that cause nerve impulses to send to the brain. Brain stu uh, stimulates posterior pituitary to release oxytocin, and oxytocin causes smooth muscle lining of the uterus to contract. Baby is pushed against cervix and, ca and causing it to stretch furthermore. The positive feedback loop occurs till the baby descends down and is delivered through vagina. Stages of labor. The first stage of labor, it is um, it has got two phases: that is latent phase and active phase. The time between the onset of labor till three to four centimeters cervical dilatation is latent phase. Active phase is the time between end of the latent phase till the full dilatation, that is 10 centimeters. Second stage of labor. Uh, time from the full dilatation of cervix to the delivery of fetus and fetuses or fetuses. Uh, there uh, are two phases that is passive and active. From the dilatation till the head touches the pelvic floor is passive phase, and active phase is when there is irresistible maternal desire to bear down 
till the baby is delivered. Now the third stage is time from the delivery of the fetus or fetuses to the complete delivery of placenta and membranes that usually last less than half hour. But when there is no active man management of placenta, it can incre uh, increase up to one hour. Now the physiology of labor. The main events that take place are the gradually increasing uterine contraction, there's dilatation of cervix, effacement of cervix, thinning of lower uterine segment, and retraction. Americans dilation link the or British Jew who dilation. Type of mistake. Type of mistake. Uterine contractions in labor, there are some characteristics of uterine contractions. They are rhythmical, symmetrical, polarity uh, effect, and retraction effect. Uh, the uh, uterine contractions are usually rhythmical. That progressively increase in intensity, frequency, uh, frequency and duration. And uh, uh, the tone at the start of labor is 20 millimeter of mercury that can increase up to about 150 millimeter of mercury at the end stage, uh, at the second stage of labor. The, they are usually symmetrical. That is, uh, the, they originate from the uh, upper part of the uterus from, uh, that lies close to the tube known as tubal ostia. And uh, uh, these are also called pacemakers of uh, uh, pacemakers of uterine contractions. The polarity is maximum intensity is at the fundus, and as we go down, the intensity decreases. Uh, this effect helps the pressure gradient uh, for uh, the fetus to bear uh, to uh, move in the downward direction. Now, first we will discuss the retractive effect, as Sir has beautifully explained. The muscle fibers retract after each successive contraction. There is permanent shortening of the lower uterine segment. The cavity becomes small and the fetus is forced to descend. It also has other effects, that is formation of the lower uterine segment, dilatation and effacement of cervix. It reduces the cervix area of the uterus that favors the placental separation. It also helps in the effective hemostasis after the separation of placenta. Now here is the diagrammatic representation where you can see there is active segment that is thick segment and uh, um, the upper uterine segment that is active and thick. The lower segment is passive and it is thin segment with the progression that is uh, dilatation of cervix and uh, progression of labor. The lower segment really shortens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The cervix that is formed of collagen uh, um, collagen fibers and uh, the ground substance. Um, in these, uh, each of the collagen fiber, they are uh, glued together in, uh, with the ground substance in such a manner that they form a firm fibromuscular uh, uh, ring that, uh, uh, that provides tensile strength to the cervix. Now, when there is release of prostaglandin E2, the ripening of cervix and softening of cervix occurs. That occurs uh, through uh, um, that occurs through the mechanism that is when there is uh, there is increase and uh, there is vasodilatation of cervix that causes increased permeability of neutrophils uh, that have uh, collagenase and elastase enzymes that break down the collagen. Also, there is fluid accu accumulation occurs between the ground substance. So, uh, ripening of cervix. Here is the diagrammatic representation of dilatation of cervix. Effacement of cervix is the process by which cervix shortens in length and is incorporated in the lower uterine segment. In primary gravita, the effacement occurs before dilatation of cervix. In multigravita, effacement and dilatation occur at the same time. As you can see, the length of the cervix is progressively uh, decreasing uh, down as the labor continues. Now here's another diagrammatic representation, how the contraction of the uterus occurs, there's dilatation and there's bulging of the amniotic sac. Now, before we start the mechanism of normal labor, we should know some of the boundaries of the pelvic inlet and outlet. 
and the diameters of pelvic inlets and outlets that help us to understand how the mechanism works. The upper bar, the pelvic inlet is formed by the uh, upper border of the pubic symphysis. Uh, pelvic inlet, it is formed by the upper border of the uh, pubic symphysis, uh, iliopectorial line, ala of the sacrum, and upper border of the sacral promontory. While the uh, pelvic outlet, it is formed by uh, pubic, uh, lower border of the pubic symphysis, uh, inferior ramus of pubis, ischial, uh, uh, ischial tuberosities, sacral tuberous ligament, and uh, um, last piece of the sacrum. Uh, obstetrical, uh, now the diameters. Uh, the most important diameter for the fetal head to engage, it is uh, pelvic inlet, uh, the maximum diameter is uh, um, transverse diameter, which is 13.5 centimeter, and uh, anthroposterior diameter is 11, uh, 11 centimeter, 11.5 centimeter. Now the obstetrical conjugate. The actual phase, the space that is available to the fetal head is the distance between the posterior surface of the symphysis pubis to the sacral pulmonary, which is 11.5 centimeters. Very good. Impressive. You see, when I don't know how many of you know about the clinical estimation of the balance assessment. When we do pelvic assessment, then there, is, there are no calibers that we are using. Previously, it used to be uh, a radiological or X-ray pelvic imagery in which exact measurements were done and uh, there were few views which were taken, but that's no obsolete. So clinical assessment of the pelvis used to be done at 26 weeks. I stopped doing it a long time back. But what we did was that if there is... Now, this is the pelvic inlet. There are uh, only three figures which you have to remember for uh, various diameters of the pelvis. And inlet transverse diameter is the largest, and anthroposterior diameter is smallest. So, a figure of 11, 12, 13. So, the uh, anthroposterior diameter and the inlet is 11 centimeter. Transverse is uh, 13 centimeters. And if you take the outlet, here the anthroposterior diameter, this is the this is the uh, sacrum. So the uh, the from the posterior border of the uh, pubic surface to the sacrum, not the coccyx, the last piece of the sacrum, it is 13 centimeters, and it, between the two ischial velocities or two ischial spines as well, it is. Uh, 11 centimeters. So it is reverse of the inlet. And in the within the cavity, it's 12 centimeters and the posterior 12 centimeters transfer. And that's why, because it is uh, uh, transverse here, it's the largest, the head usually enters the pelvis into uh, a transverse, in transverse position, transverse diameter. While it goes through that, for coming out, because the anthroposterior diameter is large, so it rotates through one eighth of a circle, and then is delivered like this will go into stage. So these diameters, as she said, that you need to look at the pony pelvis and see that sacrum along the sacral promontory, along the sacrum eupectinal line, and the top of the now, what, how we measured at that time the, because this is uh, the top of the pubic symphysis and the sacral promotory that is known as true conjugate. But sacral promotory is a little convex posterior thing. So, from the sacral promotory to the middle of the most prominent posterior part of the uh, say uh, 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 the or pubic 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 that would be a little shorter, about half a centimeter or a centimeter shorter than the true conjugate. That is known as obstetrical conjugate, which is from the sacral promontory to the most prominent uh, posterior part of the uh, pubic symphysis. 
Now, what we can actually do with clinical is on pelvic examination, if we pass our fingers vaginally and we try to assess reach the sacral promotion. So, my fingers are a little longish than probably hers, and I can easily access that. And therefore, it was thought in that sense that you should know that in the distance between the tip of your middle finger to the base of the thumb. So, if this is that, and you can reach the sacral promotion from there, then that is the, that is called as the yeah. diagonal conjugate. So, diagonal conjugate is Sir, we do not near. five centimeters, and from there you deduct about two or three centimeters, then you would get the two conjugate or the obstacle of the conjugate. Similarly, uh, uh, you assess the ischial spine by ischial spine would be somewhere here. So when you are passing it here, you stretch your fingers and with your fingertips have an assessment of what's the distance between this. It generally is of 10 centimeters. And for the sacral, for the ischial fibrosity, you place your, you should know the distance between the, 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 the whole the knuckles of the hand. So that if you push your knuckles at the anal area and you can fit your head in between the ischial fibrosity, then you will have good assessment of the, uh, the distance between that, either it is narrow or it is wide. Like in platycular uh, pelvis, it is wide at that time. But we are not going into that. But generally, it was considered that you should know the distance between the tip of your and do that. So, the rigid ball of the food was the case for your sitting. You measure that distance, you should know that, and also the distance between your knuckles. Yes. So, the conjugate you have was made uh, diagonal conjugate, true conjugate, and the obstetrical conjugate. Yes. Yes. Now, this is the outlet. You see, with 13. Centimeters and eleven centimeters. Now the fetal diameters. The transverse diameter is bilateral diameter, which is the longest diameter. That is nine point five centimeter, largest diameter. And there's also bifid temporal diameter, which is eight centimeter. Now the anterior posterior diameters of fetus. First, we will uh, we should know the clinical significance of anterior posterior diameter. The diameter that present to the maternal pelvis, it depends upon the degree of flexion of the fetal head. When the flex is de uh, when the head is deflexed, uh, the diameter is larger and it is less favorable and there may be difficulty in labor. Now the diameters are, there is suboccipital brigmatic diameter. Uh, 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 this, this is important slide. This diagram with the fully flexed head, gradually, you know, as the pregnancy reaches term, the amount of fluid like the, that decreases, the uh, baby goes, of course, to fill up the uterine cavity. And because of the compression and because of natural factors, there is an increase in attitude of flexion of the baby. Normally, the legs are flexed in front of the abdomen and the arms are also flexed in front of the chest of the baby. The baby, the baby is kind of sitting like that. And uh, its uh, head is also uh, so uh, flexed that the chain touches the, this is the maximum flexion. Now, the significance of that is that when the head of the fetus is uh, uh, completely flexed like this, maximum flex, then the diameter, which is the most prominent one, is suboccipital, below from below occipital, suboccipital pragmatic. Bregma, you know, is the anterior fontanelle. That is considered to be 9.5 centimeter in average, right? Similarly, from below the uh, lower jaw to the bregma, which is submental pragmatic, that also is 9.5. The largest one is mental vertical. Mental vertical is 13 points, which is in a deflexed head, and that is in case of bra presentation. So in face presentation, it will be submental vertical, the uh, submental pragmatic. In most of the uh, vertex presentations, it is the suboccipital pragmatic. Now, if the hand is not so very well flexed, what happens? 
then a comparatively larger diameter would be thrown across the pelvis. And that might delay labor, delay labor or cause obstruction of labor. So it is important to know those landmarks on the people's head. And also at the time of pelvic examinations, when you can access the fetal head and you can palpate it, then you should uh, try to palpate uh, which position of the fetal head it is and what are the sutures like. Uh, and you should also develop a method of for yourself to assess well, 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 how, how do you assess the sutures on the book? Now, let, let's say this is the fetal head. Now, what you do is, or if there are sutures like that, that you put your finger in one place, the other finger at the other place, and then you rotate your fingers like this and see how many sutures yet you can feel. If your uh, finger is at the sagittal suture, then you can feel two sutures. That means this is the oxbone, because the occipital bone and the two parietal bones, right? So, uh, you have one finger on one suture, and you rotate it through 360 degrees, and you can encounter only two other sutures. So, total three sutures, and that is the area which is the occipital. If you can evade one, two, and three, because frontal bone is got a suture in between. It is not ossified completely as such. So therefore, you will feel your finger is on sagittal suture. Then you will feel uh, uh, frontal parietal. Sir, picture is not near. The suture within the uh, frontal bone and then the other frontal parietal. So you will feel three other sutures. That would mean that it is the anterior part of the fetal bone. So this is how you palpate uh, uh, at, at the clinical examination and know of the fetal head's position. Um, sir has already explained the diameter. Can you tell me? Tell me. Yeah, look, that flexion. We, so that is 9.5 centimeter with full flexion vertex. Now, in the flex head, 11.5 centimeter. So that is. So then, what happens? The uterus continues to contract. Either there is further flexion or there is molding or there is uh, and for the head to come down or there is obstruction. So capital formation and all that and then we know that it's problem. I had a broad presentation. Um, sir, up uh, demo there, there uh, suboccipital pragmatic diameter, uh, which is the... Um, uh, yeah, that is yeah, the diagram. Uh, that occurs in vertex presentation, which is 9.5 centimeter. It is the smallest diameter and found in the fully flexed head. It starts from the base of the occiput to the brigma. The occipital frontal diameter is occurs in occipital posterior position, which is 11.5 centimeter. It occurs in slightly deflexed head. It starts from the occipital um, protuberance to the root of the nose. Occipital protuberance to the root of the nose. Now the mental vertical diameter. Um, it is, um, it occurs in broad presentation, which is 13.5. I'll demonstrate it again. It is the largest diameter, which is most unfavorable diameter. It starts from uh, the chin to the center of the sagittal suture. It is about 13.5 centimeter. Sub uh, mental pragmatic diameter, which is 9.5 centimeter, occurs in face presentation. It uh, uh, from it is from the junction of the chin and next to the center of brigma. Now, to, uh, we should know the knowledge of uh, uh, some of the uh, definitions uh, that help us um, in uh, to um, that help us uh, to know the relationship of the fetus to the pelvis. These are lie relationship of the long axis of the fetus to the long axis of the centralized uterus or maternal spine. There are three types that is longitudinal lie, oblique, and transverse lie. Presentation is the part which occupies the. Now, you see, uh, for a uh, normal labor to take place as it is, uh, you know, the uterine cavity is uh, oblong. It is uh, in this fashion, and it's uh, long, uh, longer diameter is in. From above downwards, and uh, short uh, the transverse diameter is short. 
So the baby, with passage of time, assumes that position which is convenient for it to lie in the uterine cavity. Uh, that's why if, if, if we dis if discuss the other uh, yes. 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 So these are two types of shapes which are available and this the head lies like that in this the head can be it can be in any manner. So if the shape of the uterine cavity is uh, uh, distorted, by either uh, say fibroids, or there is excessive amount of fluid, like an excessive like that will contribute towards or or in in an oblong case, there is placenta here and the resulting uterine cavity is rounded, then again it will be malformation. It will be conducive to malformation. But mostly it is uh, the cavity is like this, and therefore the fetus assumes the position of so that its long axis of the fetus conforms with the long axis of the uterus. uterus. And then either it can be head or it can be breached. The head can be in the upper part. That's why at 28 weeks, the incidence of breach presentation is almost 25%. And but what happens is that this again forms a comparatively smaller mass compared to the buttocks altogether. And the fetus has enough room to move around and moving around, it finds that it conforms better to the uterine cavity with the head in the lower pole of the uterus. That's why at term, 95% of the fetuses are longitudinal and with a cephalic presentation. And the breech the presentation is only in a couple of less than 5%. So there is spontaneous version of the or uh, movement of the fetus to conform with the. So if the size uh, uh, uterus is the kind of softer, like in multipara, uh, so what are the factors which contribute to malpresentations or abnormal lying? Those are multiparity, excessive amount of life any tumor or fibroid like thing which is distorting the uterine cavity in a manner that it makes it go rounded or a low line to center or even because this part is it is the this you know is the pelvis so if there is contracted pelvis then the, the available space for the fetus is uh, not really in this part of the, in the ella of the uh, the sacred uh, ella of the, uh, the, the uh, what are the bones in object bones or whatever the the false pelvis which is formed uh, high up that is the false pelvis so there is lesser room for the uterus to get accommodated and it again makes it a little rounded cap. so capella pelvis this part small pelvis also contributes towards a malposition. So the lie of the fetus uh, uh, in comparison to the long axis of the uterus, that makes it lie, as she's going to explain. And the part of that, uh, the fetus, which is overlying the pelvic inlet, that is the presentation. Uh, now the presentation is the part which occupies the lower pole of the uh, uterus. It may be cephalic or pedalic or shoulder presentation. The presenting part is the part of presentation which overlies the internal os and uh, it is felt by the examining fingers through the cervical opening. Attitude. Uh, it tells us about the degree of flexion and extension. It is the position of the fetal head with the fetal spine. 
Now the position is the relationship of presenting part to the maternal pelvis. Uh, there are uh, many positions that a fetus can take in relation to the maternal pelvis. That will be occiput right, left occipital anterior, right, left occipital posterior, or occipital transverse positions. Now, the series of movements that occur on the head in the process of adaptation during its journey through the pelvis, it is called mechanism of labor. There are some principles that is descent takes place throughout labor. Whatever part leads and first meets the pelvic floor will rotate forward until it comes under the pubic centipede. And whatever part emerges from the pelvis, it will pivot around pelvic bones. There are some criteria for mechanism of normal labor. That is, lie must be longitudinal, presentation must be cephalic, and the position is occipital anterior, that, uh, that may be right or left. Attitude is flexion, and the denominator is occipital. The presenting part is really posterior part of the anterior parietal bone. Now, the cardinal movements. There is engagement, descent, flexion, internal rotation, extension, restitution, external Internal rotation, extension, restitution, external rotation, and delivery of shoulders and fetal body. Uh, yeah, you said. Uh, now, she is described what is there are eight points. Uh, delivery of shoulders and fetal body, no, or and then no, Baki, you have a step, start for you. Recently, I had a 2021 American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology made paper. I have. It is four movements, not seven. Uh, topic hai, uska, uh, paper ka title hai. It's four movements, not seven. Because uh, traditionally, abhi tak bhi, jo movements bataayi jati hain, wo ye hai, uh, flexion, as the head enters the pelvis, it comes against the resistance of the soft tissue in the pelvic floor, so that enhances its attitude of flexion. And then with further uterine pushing down by the uterine contractions, the most forward part of the fetal uh, head that moves anteriorly. So that is known as internal rotation. That is the second movement. And then the head is delivered by a movement of extension when its occiput is fixed kind of is it, against the lower bottom of the pubic surfaces. And then the head is borne by a movement of extension at the neck. And after it has done that, because the shoulders are still in an oblique position, the, there is external rotation that the head assumes its original position vis-a-vis -vis shoulders. But there are two components of that. One is known as restitution. Restitution is that. And then when the shoulders, uh, they become in an anterior posterior direction, then there is further movement of one eighth circle, which makes it uh, because originally it moved one fourth of a circle from transverse to anterior, then uh, one eighth back to its uh, um, uh, the, that external uh, rotation, which is restitution, and one eighth further uh, external rotation to be in, uh, properly configured with the shoulders. So those are the four external uh, essential cardinal movements. But now uh, people have kind of, uh, there, there are many references in which engagement, descent, flexion. Actually, it started with flexion, internal rotation, and uh, uh, extension, and external rotation, which had an element of restitution. So remember that those are the four essential movements. Now the engagement. Fetal head usually engages in occipital transverse position. Head is engaged when the widest part, that is bipartial diameter, 9.5 centimeter, has passed the pelvic rim. Clinically, it is two-fifth palpable for abdomen, and on pelvic examination, it is at zero station, that is at the level of ischial spine. Here we can see the engagement in the head is about to engage in the occipital transverse uh, diameter. Now the descent. The downward passage of the head through the pelvis. The factors involved are pressure of the amniotic fluid, pressure of the fundus upon the fetus with contractions and contractions of the maternal abdominal muscles, and there's extension, uh, extension and straightening of the fetal body. Flexion. As the head descends and meets the resistance from the pelvic floor, the head bends forward, causing its chin to rest on the sternum. 
The presenting diameter here is suboccipital rhythmatic, which is 9.5 centimeter, which is the shortest anterior posterior diameter. Flexion increases throughout labor. You can see the flexion has occurred. It is flexion. Now, internal rotation. On reaching the pelvic gutter of the levator and eye muscles, the head is well flexed and occiput is the leading point. Now here the head rotates internally from occipital transverse to the occipital anterior position. The sagittal suture now lies in anterior posterior diameter of pelvic outlet, which is the widest diameter, and the uh, pubic symphysis lies anterior to the occiput. Here we can see uh, first it was left occipital anterior, and now it has become occipital anterior. Uh, at the start of labor, the head entered the pelvic inter inlet in transverse uh, diameter. Then there is right occipital anterior, and then it is uh, occipital anterior position. Now the crowning. Head crowns when the widest part of the head passes through the pelvic outlet and it does not move backwards when the mother stops pushing. Extension of the head. The sharply flexed head reaches vulva. Here the two forces come into play. Posteriorly exerted by the uterus and down coming head and anteriorly there is pelvic floor resistance. The resultant vector results in vulval opening and there is forward thrust and head is delivered by extension. The parts that come out is occiput, bregma, forehead, nose, mouth, and finally the chin. Here is complete extension. Now restitution. After the head is delivered, uh, it rotates to come in line with the shoulders. It is the slight rotation of the occiput through only one eighth of the circle. It is passive movement. This is a restitution. Now the external rotation is shoulders rotate into direct anterior posterior plane. To achieve this, the occiput further rotates through one half of the circle to obtain the transverse position. So <laughs> Now, expulsion of the rest of the body. After restitution and external rotation, shoulder will be in anterior posterior position. Anterior shoulder is under pubic surfaces. Oh, shoulder delivers <laughs> <laughs> And it delivers first, followed by the delivery of the posterior shoulder. Lateral traction is often exerted by gentle, gently pulling the fetal head in the downward direction to help the release anterior shoulder from the pubic. Uh, this is important. You, you, one should not be over enthusiastic in uh, uh, pulling the head to one side or the other. Otherwise, you, one could cause uh, nerve damage uh, to the baby. So one has to be very careful about that. Rest of the body is delivered easily with posterior shoulder guided over perineum by the traction in the opposite direction. Now delivery of the anterior shoulder. And delivery of the posterior shoulder. Yes, of course, that all occurred in haze, for moments of haze. Very good. There are a couple of things that I would want to say. Yes, sir. That gradually the uh, uh, the quality of our presentation by the residents has improved a lot. We must have observed. And the way uh, uh, she has explained, she has uh, talked about it, she fully understood that. So this is the advantage of uh, giving these presentations to you. Instead of... Uh, Myself or we know or someone else making a presentation, he would just listen to it. But at least one person uh, gets uh, the advantage and uh, reads it through 
works on that and uh, understands that. And when one of your colleagues is doing that, then uh, I'm sure that you are motivated more to look up yourself the details and uh, then uh, understand like, what is it like. So if she can understand what is the mechanism of uh, initiation of labor, start of labor, then how can you push about so that or I should also be able to do that. So I think that uh, this is a very good uh, 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 exercise in that regard. And uh, you've done very well. Good, mm -hmm. so this is uh, so this is this we have uh, made a makeshift uh, pelvis this is the pelvic inlet and this is the uh, sacral promontory and of the sacrum iliopectineal line. This is the top of the pubic symphysis. And uh, if uh, I place my hand just like that, then that would uh, be the sacrum. So, and this is the uh, lower border of the pubic symphysis. And this, by this way, you can see that this is the inlet and the transverse diameter of the inlet is larger. It is 13. And uh, the anthroposterior diameter is comparatively shorter, which is 11 uh, centimeters. And if we look at the outlet, so this is the lower border and imagine the two ischiotibrosities here, the lower border of the pubic symphysis to the last uh, uh, the vertebra of the uh, sacrum, not the coccyx, that would form the anthroposterior diameter and the two ischiotibrosities and the ischial spines, they will form the, uh, ischial spines actually are in the mid cavity. So the ischial tuberosities would be forming the lateral boundaries of the outlet. Now, uh, when we used to do these days, I haven't done, I don't know, do a clinical assessment of the pelvis, but for teaching purposes of pelvic assessment, why I don't do is that when the, uh, if, if generally, if the uh, girl is of average height and build, and the baby is because you have to uh, measure the pelvis in relation to the expected or estimated weight of the baby. Now, if that is average, now uh, weight of the baby previously we used to assess only by clinical uh, assessment, by palpation of the uh, abdomen, we used to have some idea, which one can be wrong, uh, rather widely wrong. Uh, uh, there are factors like uh, the body's fat and the, uh, the total physique and the stature of the uh, girl also, that, that that's important in that. So therefore, uh, I would allow a woman, a primary gravita particularly, to go into labor and see how it uh, uh, fares, how it progresses. Because there are three factors which are responsible for the progress of labor, generally said to be powers, uterine contractions, or uh, the, then the other is the passenger, which is the uh, fetus, and the passage, so power, passage, this injury. So these are the three. So when we are now concentrating on assessment of the uh, passage, in that the bony pelvis is important because the softer tissues, they can expand, they can uh, stretch, and they can provide that room for the baby to pass down. But the bones have uh, essentially no room to expand. They are on fixed joints. Although there is a little bit of subluxation uh, somewhere, but there are fixed joints, the sacroiliac joints on the pubic symphysis, they are fixed. So therefore, it was important to assess what is the, uh, if the pelvis, is, or and to rule out if the pelvis was grossly uh, smaller. Now, uh, for inlet, and then I said that there used to be radiographic, there used to be lateral pelvimetry, anthroposterior view, one, one was from inlet's uh, view, but they are now not used. So the clinically, what we used to do is pelvic examination at 36 weeks to assess 
the balance, one would take into account the, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. First, let me uh, get on with this. So uh, the anterior posterior diameter of the pelvic inlet was assessed by indirect method by this pelvic examination. When I, uh, let's say the examiner puts their fingers and tries to reach the sacral promontory. Therefore, it was said that you should uh, know the distance between the tip of your middle finger to the base of the thumb. And because this is what you are actually, you are not placing in any uh, foot rule or a tape or mayor, but you are placing your fingers in the uh, pelvis. And by that, you would have good idea. If I do that, and I'll put my finger here, which is the lower border of the previous emphasis. Now, this is the distance of the uh, distance between the lower border of the pubic symphysis and the sacral promontory. This is known as the diagonal conjugate. Diagonal conjugate generally is said to be uh, uh, adequate if it is 13.5 centimeters because the uh, obstetrical conjugate, the actual distance between the sacral promontory and the most prominent posterior part of the pubic symphysis would be about 11 centimeters, which will be two to three centimeters less than the <laughs> diagonal conjugate. So if you estimate that, and then uh, you, you have good assessment of the diagonal. And the true conjugate used to be the distance between the upper border of the uh, pubic symphysis to uh, the sacral promontory, which was a little about half to one centimeter, about half centimeter uh, larger or longer than the uh, obstetrical conjugate. What one would be interested in is the true conjugate. Now, when uh, generally one would teach about the pelvic assessment, one would talk about the height, height of the girl, or it used to be said the shoe size, because if there is a larger shoe size, that would mean the larger body structure and larger body frame and larger pelvis. Uh, then uh, the gait, you see the woman walking and she doesn't have any disability, uh, but if she is limping, then that limp might have been earlier on some sometime at maybe at the time of development and that might have distorted unilaterally part of the limb. And then you also examined at the legs, any fracture or any shortening of the leg, also look at the spine. So those were the general things. Number one, look at the well, eyes, gait, then examine the spine, the legs, and the limbs, uh, because those would affect the development of the body pelvis. And uh, then abdominal examination. At uh, 36 weeks, generally it was assumed that the head would be settled in the upper part of the pelvis at least. So if the head is high up, it's uh, uh, floating high above the pelvis, that might also indicate a comparatively narrower pelvis, which is, is isn't along the road, but that's one factor. It may be that the development of the lower segment at that time, but that would also raise your suspicion for that it might be a uh, comparatively in a shorter girl, uh, the, the, the pelvis is rather small. So when you do abdominal examination, you assess the fetal size, you assess the lie of the fetus, if it is abnormal, that also may be indicative of a uh, narrow pelvis. So if it is longitudinal lie, if it is a valid presentation, it is well settled, that would be reassuring, that would mean that the pelvis is, free, it is likely to be anyway. And uh, then you do pelvic examination. For pelvic examination, of course, because at that time, in a primary gravida, if you are going to do a pelvic examination in which you are going to try to reach sacral promontory, that's going to be pretty uncomfortable. You see, if you do pelvic examination in a primary gravida at some uh, or uh, the, during the time of uh, pregnancy, two-digit examination is always uncomfortable. That's why, you know, I generally profess that if you see the progress of labor, you are examining women, or even in gynecological examination, I prefer examination only by one, one finger. And that, of course, is an adequate amount of information that you want to get. Uh, but if it is not available and you want to assess it more, then, of course, then uh, you do those measures that you uh, explain to the woman that it's going to be a little uncomfortable. Then you place your fingers at the portion to the posterior part of the vulval opening, then you press it a little bit. Pressing it is 
that is not painful, that rather allows the woman to relax her perineal muscles a little bit. So you press it gently, and then you slide your fingers along the posterior medial walls, avoiding touching the vestibular area, which is more sensitive. So you, you go along like that. So you explain to the woman that it's not going to be uncomfortable. It, uh, it may be a little uncomfortable, but it's not going to be painful. And if it is, uh, it is painful, then we we'll stop. And of course, before that, the bladder should be empty. You should ask her to empty her bladder. And then you, uh, after having explained then in dorsal position, you pass your fingers like that. And then you try to assess whether you can reach the sacral promontory or not. And by reaching the sacral promontory, you will then assess the diagonal point of view. And from that, you will ask. And then you also, uh, you also at that time have an assessment, not only the diagonal point of view, but you move your fingers on both sides to have a feel of what are the ella of the sacrum line. Right? So you move your fingers like that. The, uh, projection of the sacral promontory, and, and then you move also your fingers along the sacrum here. What is the, uh, is it flat? It is, it's a sometimes flat. Is it concave or uh, or how much it is uh, protruding the, the sacral tip, how much it is protruding forward? So you have an assessment of the mid cavity like that. You also palpate the ischial spines. And then when you are bringing it out, then you stretch your fingers below the pubic surfaces, you see what is the angle like. It is uh, an obtuse angle or it's an acute angle or uh, it's narrow or it's wide. And then finally, then you place your clenched fist in between the scale tuberosities to uh, assess the distance between the two tuberosities. So this is how you perform the clinical examination of assessment of the ठीक है बहुत शाबाश ये लेक्चर शेयर करो ये ये लड़कियों तो लोग ये जाके पढ़ना सारा और वो इनिशिएशन ऑफ लेबर वाला उसको उसको कंपैरेटिवली सिंपल कर लो कि उसको वो इस तरह से कहा जाता है कि जिस तरह से ट्यूबर्टी पे चिट्री से एपिथेलियल सेलेक्टर लीव ऑन अ टूल यू नो ओवरीज आर एबल टू रिस्पोंड टू गनेडोट्रोपिन्स व्हेनेवर दे आर प्रोवाइडेड even at the age of two months or four months, the ovaries will respond to that. So it is the picture tree, which is not mature or whatever, it is not producing epithelial damage. When at time of puberty, it starts producing that, then the ovaries become active, they go through their cycle, they produce estrogen, which is born, and then the cycle begins. Similarly, the, when the fetus gets a certain level of maturity, which is around 36, 37 weeks, then the pituitary, uh, hypothalamus pituitary axis that, that actually uh, uh, starts functioning in the sense that it starts producing corticotropin hormones. And corticotropin hormones then produce simply, as she said, those two hormones. Uh, one is the, the what's the other? The cortisol and the DHA. Cortisol and the DHA, the hydro and the androsterone. And androstenedione, the hydro epi androstenedione, which is uh, an androgenic hormone. Cortisol is important for lung maturity. So that, that, that happens. And DHEA, the hydro epi androstenedione, that is converted into estrogen. So whereas previously there was predominance of progesterone from placenta, and that was keeping the uterus quiet. Uh, now there is now preponderance of Estrogens. So estrogens, uh, the balance is tilted. Estrogens help produce prostaglandin F2 alpha and uh, E2, prostin E2, E2, and there are other other uh, factors also. Women don't go egg diagram or the counter egg diagram. So go go say kiss it. So go go usme jaise cervix soft hona shuru hoti hai, uterus ki activity badhna shuru ho jati hai. और वो फिर प्रोसेस ऑफ लेबर एक क्रिटिकल स्टेज आती है इसमें इसी तरह से ऑक्सीटोसिन रिसेप्टर्स जो हैं उनकी डेवलपमेंट हो जाती है एंड ऑक्सीटोसिन वो फिर देन पोस्टीरियर पिचुट्री वुड प्रोड्यूस ऑक्सीटोसिन एंड देन 
this process is later going to be So, this is the case. This is the case. Simplify the gap junction. We will see the same thing. 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 We और Thank you very much for all those who are still listening. Sign on for now. Thank you.